To download more lectures, learn more about our project, and to help support it, visit www.bayina.com slash dream. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H slash dream. You are free to share these recordings with family and friends. Thank you and Jazakumullah Khairan for helping us make our dream a reality. So there's the potential of the human being to reach the highest heights, 
And that's illustrated in three consecutive surahs. And now we're going to talk about the potential that, that of the lowest of the lows, even though he was designed to reach those heights. It's not like he wasn't capable of them. Allah created him be actually tafwin. Even though that is the case, he reduces himself to the lowest of the low, and we'll talk about that. So let's begin, inshallah ta'ala, with uh, this law. One of the other introductory comments that I want to make before you just to mentally prepare you for the subject matter. Um, in modern discourse, especially among uh, non-religious, even Muslims, there is this subconscious understanding that the religion does not deal with philosophical or complex or sophisticated issues. The, the Quran is simplistic, it was talking to a bunch of Bedouin Arabs who weren't very complex in their thinking. We're living in modern, sophisticated times, and we need modern, sophisticated philosophy and language and you know, things in the world of psychology and anthropology and sociology, these are sophisticated things. But the religion speaks in very simplistic terms. It's speaking at a very low level. And this is actually, this is not something new. This allegation was made hundreds of years ago in the Muslim world before. And it's made, been made about religion in general anyway. And the allegation was, well, Aristotle and Plato and these philosophers, they speak in very high terms. But, you know, these Muslims, they, they have very linear, straightforward kind of thinking. It's unimpressive. It's not complex enough. It's not abstract enough. So the idea was, and this actually some quote-unquote Muslim philosophers adapted this idea that the Qur'an is talking to the masses. The Qur'an is talking to the masses. But its real philosophical understanding is not actually in there. It's, it's a level above, and that's what the philosophers. That's what the philosophers, right? So in, in, a, in our contemporary times, something of that idea even remains in the mind of many Muslims. That really the religion doesn't deal with sophistication. And we're going to see a counter to that today, inshallah ta'ala. This is one of the most in-depth surahs of the Qur'an and insight into the human being and the honor and the nobility of Allah granted the human being. So we begin with a series of oaths, three ayat. وَتِينِي وَزَيْتُمْ وَطُورِ سِينِي وَحَابِلْ بَرْدِكَ أَمِينَ Three ayat of which Allah takes an oath. We've talked about the surahs of oath before and we learned that whenever Allah takes an oath, He is going to now give a jawab al-qasm. It's called jawab al-qasm. He's going to respond to that oath. For example, in English, you don't say, I swear, and you stop there. You say, I swear, you swear what? I swear I'm going to kill you. I swear I'll pay you back. Something. You're going to add something at the end of that, right? That's called jawab al qasm So the first part, wa tini wa zaytun, wa turi sini, wa haad al baladi amin, these are the oaths. But then, laqad khalaqna al insana fi ahsani taqweem, the next ayah is going to be the response to the oath, the jawab al qasm and we also discussed before that the oaths are always connected to the response of the oath. So when, once we go through the meanings and the interpretation of the oaths, and we discuss the response to the oath, then it's our job to actually connect the two. You can't just study them one by one by one and move on. Until you understand that connection, you're not going to understand the rest of the discourse. And usually in the surahs that have an oath and a response to the oath, that oath and its response are the central message of that surah. You miss that, you miss the whole thing. If you don't understand that, then you're, you're not really going to understand how everything in that surah, the entire discourse, connects. So we begin with, with the first ayah, what Tini was saying. I'll, I'll begin with very simple translation. I swear by the fig and the olive. Okay, I swear by the fig and the olive. The fig, the fig, and the zaytun, the olive. Waturi sini, easy translation, and I swear by Mount Sinai. Okay, and by my, Mount Sinai. So uh, fig, olive, Mount Sinai, and then what happened by the thing, I mean, and this entrusted city. And this peaceful city also. Multiple meanings are possible here. Okay. Now, if you look at it at a shallow level, fig and olive food items. Fig and olive food items. And Mount Sinai and this city are locations. So it seems like there are two food items and two locations. Keep this in the back of your mind as I discuss some of the, the, uh, uh, the meanings and interpretations of these oaths. Let's begin with the more complex one. What uh, was it doing? A theme uh, occurs in the Quran a number of times. And it also, it's, it's blessings, the fig, it's blessings have even been talked about in the sunnah, in the hadith of the Prophet For example, he said, He said, eat it. You know, make a habit of eating it, because if I was to say there's a fruit that belongs to Jannah, it's this one, because the fruits of Jannah, they don't have pits in them, they don't have seeds in them. They're pitless, okay? So that's why he actually even alluded to the fact that it's a fruit from Jannah. Some people that are into conjecture and into a lot of, um, I'll just say curious kind of tafsir, took this a little far and they said as follows, they said, Deen is a fruit of Jannah, okay? And Jannah has how many gates, you know? It has eight gates, eight gates, right? And so the theme has eight ayat, aha. 
right? So that's how they connect. If this is, you know, قد يكون هو أطلاقات. This could be coincidences. That's not really a proper approach to, to see. But nonetheless, this, these kinds of comments are also found in some segments of uh, the see. Anyhow, so it's, it's a blessed thing. Then, of course, because of the Ahadith of the Prophet, it's considered a tree from paradise. It's a blessed tree. And then there was a debate among the Mufassirun whether when Allah says the fig, is he really talking about the fig? Or is he talking about a location that is known for figs? Because in the Arabic expression, in Arabic idiom, in classical Arabic times, you used to call a place by the thing for which it was famous. Now we don't do this in our times. You know when you call New York the Big Apple, don't expect to buy Big Apples at the grocery store, right? It's not, there's no connection. But in Arabic, you know, there's Wadi Nahda. Right, the, the, the name of the valley is a Nahda. Why? Because it's full of not the palm trees. It's full of it. So it's called by that name itself. Right? Similarly, when the word Deen is used, and actually a Baqi Allah even cited some ancient poetry in which the word Deen was used to refer to a location. Now what that location is, we'll talk about in a second. But one school of Mufassim essentially say this is the fig itself. Because Allah loves the fig, and the Hadith talks about the fig being the blessed thing, and that's why Allah swears by it. And the other group says, no, this is not actually the fig, this is referring to the region in which the fig grows. In which the fig grows. Now there are two opinions about where this fig grows. Some say it's, uh, actually multiple opinions, some say it's uh, uh, Syria, the mission. Okay, some say Damascus. Some say that it's southern Iraq, and a region where Ibrahim Ali Islam used to be. Some say this is a valley between Hamdan and Hilwan, this is the stronger of the opinions that I found at least. That there's a, this is a Ruf al Ma'ani, there's a, there's a valley between Hamdan and Hilwan, which has a lot of uh, mountains, and in those mountains, there's a lot of growth of fig. And this series is important because you know Mount Judi, where the, the Ark of, of Nuh landed, belongs in that region. So according to his interpretation, this is alluding to the region where the, the Ark of Nuh the ship, landed. Okay? So that's one, uh, uh, these are multiple interpretations of just the word uh, Atim. Of course, then we find it's it's it being talked about in blessed ways even in the Quran. And the, the next word, rather, Zaytun. When Allah Azza wa Jalla, for example, says, "Ka'annaha kawkamun turdiyun yuqadu min shajaratin mubarakatin zaytunah la shafiya wa la ghafiya." In Surah Al-Nur, when Allah talks about the purity of the heart and gives it an analogy, He talks about a land, and this land is made it's filled with the oil of a pure blessed tree, which is the tree of Zaytun. Zaytun. And it's not, it doesn't apply to the east nor the west. So he talks about this pure tree. So it's a symbol of purity, really, a zaytun. Others argue, and this is actually the opinion of Ibn Abbas, also, who argued that, that a zaytun is actually referring not just to the olive, but actually the mount of olives. The mount of olives. So there's the mountain of figs, and there's the mountain of olives. This is also in Mufal Ma'ani. They used to say, Turi Dina and Turi Zayta. These are two names, and he says these are actually Hebrew terms. The mountain of figs and the mountain of olives. But Ibn Abbas says that this is actually referring to Mashal al Aqsa. Rahimahullah, he says this is referring to a Mashal al Aqsa. So the idea is a deen possibly referring to Nuh alayhi salam. A Zaydun possibly referring to Isa alayhi salam. And this is further corroborated in the Bible. If you, if you go to the, some passages of the Bible, Jesus prayed on the Mount of Olives. Okay, in, by uh, an Aqsa, he prayed on the Mount of Olives. Now we don't go to the Bible to confirm what the Qur'an says. We don't go to the Bible for confirmation of what the Qur'an says. But the Qur'an confirms what the Bible says. Who's in the confirming position? Allah puts the Qur'an in the confirming position. So there's no harm quoting the people of the book unless you are going to them to confirm what you have. If you go to them to say, oh you know what you guys said over here could be right because we have it. Do you understand? There's no harm in this because Allah calls our kitab muhaymin, a, con a confirmer and a guardian of, of the truth that already came before. And Allah calls it musaddiqan, con confirming. So if we go to their book and we find something that's already been confirmed in ours, there's no harm. So this is possible, and the, 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 reason, the only reason I mentioned the biblical reference is because Ibn Abbas already has this opinion, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that it may re be referring to the Mount of Olives. Now, Another couple of things about this, uh, this series of words, and I'm going to just read some tafasir and some excerpts from tafasir. Shaykhiti rahimahullah writes, Annahma thamaratan al ma'rufatan, that's referring to the two uh, uh, famous fruits, but by the fruits also their lo locations. This is also the opinion of Ikrama and Hassan and Mujahid. 
So the idea that it's a fruit is also in the first generation, and the idea that these are locations is also in the first generation. It's not a later invention. Though later scholars imply one way or the other, this opinion already existed in the first generation. Then we find he says the, the uh, intent by saying Tun and Zaytun, Zaytun and Zaytun rather, are the two mountains from the Holy Land, meaning he's saying both refer to Jerusalem. So we, one opinion was, Teen refers to that valley in Hamdan and Hulan and Nuh The other opinion is Teen and Zaytun combined refer to Isa alayhi salam. Some argue that the reason Teen and Zaytun are combined is because some fruits have pits in them and the other, Teen doesn't have a pit in it and Zaytun does. Taking the olive, right? So there you come from two different kinds of fruits are alluded to. Wallahu ta'ala. But we'll come to the more important things as I, I go through this technical stuff a little bit later, inshallah. Then finally, just in at tibyan one more comment just so you have an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, Allah Azza wa says, Aqsama subhanahu bi hadil amkina thalatha al -abim. So he says altogether, even though there are four things mentioned, there are three locations. Atini wa Zaytun is one location, Atini wa Zaytun. Wa Turi Simin, obvious, there's no difference of opinion. Mount Sinai, you know, what, you know, Atur wa Turin, wa Turi wa Kitab al Mastur, also appears in the Quran. There's no difference of opinion about that. Then finally, wa Hadil wa Amin, no difference of opinion about that. The only diverse opinions are in the first ayah, wa Tini wa Zaytun. That's really where you find the difference. So, having said all of this, I want to make quick mention of the sequence. What's the benefit of saying a theme first, then a zaytun, then puri sidin, then have a What's the benefit of this sequence? The barakah of a theme, the benefit of a theme, we already said the Prophet said this is one of the fruits of Jannah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is its barakah. A zaytun afdal. Zaytun is more blessed because Allah talks about it in a higher state in the Quran. Allah gives it more elevation than theme and talks about its purity and how it, you know, it's a source of light, etc. So Zaytun is more blessed than this. Then you go beyond Zaytun, what, what's mentioned next? Polisini, Mount Sinai, the location at which the Lord of the world spoke to a human being. More blessed, even more blessed. And then finally we find this entrusted city in which the house of Allah, the, the, the source of Allah's worship is built, the house built by Ibrahim salam, the location where the final revelation to humanity came, the most blessed. And where the final messenger to humanity was born, sallallahu alayhi wa the most blessed. So you're going, what we say in Arabic, min al fadil ila al afdal. From blessed to most blessed. That's the sequence here between a teen, a zaytun, wa qulisini, wa hadha baradin. I mean, this is the, the benefit of this uh, sequence. By the way, the opinion that these are locations is also expressed in Tafsir ibn Kathir for your reference. Now let's talk a little bit about qulisini. A qul in Arabic, some consider it not an Arabic word. Others say it may be Arabic or came into Arabic later on. Okay? Tur in, has been argued to mean a lush, Ibn Abbas says this, Qatada says this, it's a lush, full of trees, green kind of mount. And the name of it, the mount of Sini. Sini. But in another place in the Quran, Allah Azza says, وَشَجَرَةً تَخْرُجُ مِنْ طُورِ سَيْنَا Sayna, which sounds closer to Sina, right? So we have Sini and we have Sayna. We have two different readings of the same location. What's the benefit of that? How come Allah in one place he says Sinin, other place he says Sayna? You see, in the Hebrew language, both variations existed and were known among their scholars. And this mountain and its name was not known among the Arabs. This messenger who is an Arab, who is an Arab, and according to their you know, uh, uh, allegation against him, he's Ummi, he can't even read. And he's telling them two different pronunciations of an exotic location according to their religion that is only known among their scholarly circles. And he's just reciting it off just like that. So the two variations, dialectical variations, of the name of that mountain and that series has actually been alluded to in the Quran. And this is part of what Allah tells us that He will teach you what you couldn't possibly have known. He teaches you what you couldn't possibly have known. And this, these illusory, uh, illusory references to people of the book are all over the Quran. Allah will tell His Messenger some information that could only have been known, you could consider at the time classified kind of information. Right? And He will just tell His Messenger that. And the people of knowledge will hear that and say, how do you know that? Where did He get that from? 
And the only idea in their mind is maybe he's got some guy who's from the people of the book and he gets it from him and that's how he's getting it. Right? This, this idea would creep into their mind. So we pass over these words, but even in them there's actually a challenge. That he is in fact a messenger. That he doesn't speak of knowledge that he has, but knowledge that's been given to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is a little bit about uh, uh, a few of the references. There are two benefits of knowing the word fool. First of all, it only occurs in the context of Bani Isra'i in the Quran, essentially. Only in the context of Bani Isra'i. And it's used in two ways. One, the takreem, to honor it. To honor it, for example, We called him from the side of Atur, to the far right, which is a reference when Musa alayhi salam, Allah spoke to Musa alayhi salam. And of course, we find in Surah Atur, wa Turi, wa Kitab al-Masur, Allah swears by Atur. When Allah swears by something, obviously, you know, has also been honored. One side note about the oaths that may or may not have come up before, I know we've talked about oaths quite a bit, it's a big subject in the Quran. Uh, Ibn Qayyim, actually, after Ibn Qayyim, uh, Hamiduddin Faraki, an Indian scholar, wrote an 80 page booklet in Arabic, Al Iman fi Aqsam al Quran. Wonderful, wonderful book. I heard it's been translated into Urdu, but not yet in English. Uh, it's a worthwhile read if you can read Urdu or Arabic. It's a very, very exhaustive research paper. It's probably the next best thing after Ibn Qayyim's paper, Rahimahullah, on oaths in the Quran. Some scholars said when Allah takes an oath, He's honoring whatever He took an oath by. Other scholars said, no, not at all. And then another group of scholars said, he is, he is honoring those things, but it means more than that too. So there's three camps. One group says, whatever Allah swears by is honored. That's it. Another group says, no, it's not honored at all. That's not the point. Not at all. And the middle group says, it may be honored, but there's more to it. Now the people who say it's not honored, what's their argument? What's their line of reasoning? They say, well, when I, when I swear by something, I always swear by something higher than myself. Okay, we're commanded to swear by Allah, for example. Right? People would swear by their honor, their dignity, etc., etc., their parents. So you, when, when somebody takes an oath, they usually refer to something higher than themselves so that they become more believable. That's the purpose of taking an oath. So why would Allah, who's the highest of the high, take an oath by something in order to elevate? He's already the most elevated. There must be some other purpose. They say the argument is he takes an oath so that those, whatever he takes an oath by is used as an evidence for what is coming or is furnished as a witness for what is coming. But the middle one says, no, Allah created things and Allah honored them too. Like for example, we, we honored the son of Adam. Allah can give honor to things. That's because Allah is the most honorable. Doesn't mean that Allah does not honor other things either. So there's that middle argument that I'm personally more inclined towards. It's not only that whatever Allah swears by is honored, and it's not only that it's not, it's not honored. It's that middle position that's probably the safest position in this uh, uh, study. وَهَادَ الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينِ Beautiful words. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, and I swear by this entrusted city. We know that Balad, as opposed to Medina in Arabic, is a city that has defined borders. So Makkah is being called an established city. And the use of that is actually it fulfills the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Every time Allah uses the word Balad for Makkah, it's actually reminding us that who wanted this to become a Balad? Because Rabbi Jal Hada Baladan Anna. Rabbi Jal Hada Al Balada Anna. Make this a well fortified. You know, well-defined city, and this dua is fulfilled every time Allah refers to the city. He calls it Balad. But the question is, why not just say Makkah, right? Why not just say the name and you're done? Why say Hada Balad Al Amin? Why point to the city and, and give it an adjective too, not just Balad Balad but Al Balad Al Amin? You know, a few surahs before, four surahs ago, Surah Al Balad, we said La Uqsimu Bihada Al Balad, but not La Uqsimu Bihada Al Balad Al Amin. Here, here we find Amin. There's a very interesting relationship between Surah Al Balad and this surah that's coming a little bit later on. But for now, let's understand the purpose of the word Al Amin. In the Arabic language, Al Amin was fun yahtamilu an yakuna min al amana, kama yahtamilu an yakuna min al amn, wa kilal ma'niyayn wa This is very powerful. The word Amin could be sourced in the word amana, amana, which means a trust. And it could be sourced in the word amn which means peace. If you make it, if you take it from the word amana, amana, then there are two possible meanings here. This city in its, it is a trust to whoever lives in it. They are entrusted to live in it. They have to abide by certain principles. Also, this is a city that is known for trusts. In other words, Allah entrusted the house of Allah in this city. Allah entrusted His final messenger in this city. Allah entrusted the final revelation, entrusted it in, Ruh al-Amin, who's also Amin. 
to the man who was a sadiq al amin and he gave him the ultimate amana in al balad al amin right so all this entrusting is taking place in this city this is one meaning if you take it from the word aman also ma'mun amin and ma'mun is implied in it if you take it from the meaning of aman it means this city is incredibly peaceful and that's part on the one hand is the blessings of the city on the other hand is the miracle of the city the miracle of the city is no matter how chaotic how crazy the arabs were how easily they would kill each other over virtually nothing right they were living like ultimate gangsters right they wouldn't turn into gangsters when they were in this if somebody saw their father's killer at the kaaba they wouldn't do they would not they would hold back this is something allah put inside the city and then other tribes who love looting and you know uh, uh, attacking they would never attack this city so this is, its peace has been entrusted the other thing that's also implied by this is when somebody visits the city automatically they feel a sense of peace wahad al balad al amin now go back to surah al balad and understand why amin wasn't mentioned you know in that surah the messenger was being attacked so the amn of the city was taken away so the word amin wasn't appropriate there because there was no peace at that time for the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know wa anta hilum bi hadha al balad he was being attacked so the wording is very precisely chosen in the quran so what had the balad al amin this entrusted this peaceful or and this uh, this city immersed in peace and all of these means are beautifully intended now we come to the response of the oath laqad khalaqna al insana fi ahsani this is the the meat of the surah this is the heart of the surah and before we get to it one last introduction these are all introductory comments we haven't connected anything yet okay um the introductory comment is the relationship between this surah and surah al balad we already kind of mentioned it a little bit but they have a very deep connection these two surahs have a very deep connection there was surah al balad then there are four surahs about the internal spiritual state of the human being four surahs so you have surah number uh, uh, 91 92 93 94 four surahs spiritual state of the human being and it climaxes with the spiritual state of the prophet himself sallallahu alaihi wasallam but the, before the series began you have surah number 90 surah al balad which is a surah of the, the struggle of the human being laqad khalaqna al-insana fi kabad a very similar ayah at the end in the 95th surah so the 90th surah four surahs in the middle and at the end again laqad khalaqna al-insana fi ahsan at-taqwim they're connected to each other on the one hand the human being is created in toil on the other in the best possible fashion meaning he's capable to engage in that toil he wasn't just put in that toil in that labor and he doesn't even know how to do it or not capable of it Allah is letting us know, yes, you are in toil, but you were designed capable. Fi ahsani taqwim. Right, so the two things are connected. Look at the oaths. There were three oaths over there, three ayat of oaths. La uqsimu bihaad al-balad, wa anta hillum bihaad al-balad, wa walidun wa ma walad. Three ayat. Here are also three ayat. Wa tini wa zaytun, wa kuri sinin, wa haad al-balad al-ameen. There mention of balad, here mention of balad. There are lots of parallels between these two surahs. Anyhow. The, the uh, two more parallels, and, and, and we actually get to the heart of the surah, inshallah ta'ala. The, actually, the third one, the second one I mentioned. فَلَقْتَحَ مَنْ عَقَرَ Allah says in Surah Al-Balad, He didn't climb the upward incline. The, the, there was a call made for the human being to rise. But if he fails to rise, where is he? If he doesn't rise, he's down here. ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَعِيرُ اللَّهُ سَبْدُ اللَّهُ Right, so there was a call to rise, and if you don't rise, you're at the lowest of the low. That's in this surah. So there are lots of beautiful parallels between the discourse of the two surahs. Now we get to the heart of the matter. I'm going to share this with you, uh, probably from a perspective that you may or may not have. I, I guess you may not have heard. The Quran deals with solutions to problems that exist today, and the Quran is an answer to confusions that afflict people today. If you don't understand the confusions afflicting people today, then you may not understand how to derive benefit from the Quran. Knowing what has been said is important, but knowing how to imply apply it is equally important. What solutions does what problems does this ayah solve? If you don't know the problem, then you can't benefit from the solution. You understand? I want to share with you in this regard a problem of humanity. Human beings in, in, nowadays think of a secular person, not a religious person, not even a Muslim, but he's a thoughtful person, he's a philosophical person, he's an observant person. Instead of you know spending his time watching movies, he spends his time watching the news, documentaries, reading books. He's well-read, sophisticated kind of person. This person probably ends up making two very 
powerful observations about humanity. And these are very common observations. One observation is about what's going on inside the human being. And one observation is about what's going on in the actions of the human being outside. One observation about the inside, one observation about the outside. Again, this observation is being made by a non-Muslim and an intellectual, right? Someone who's not connected with the religion. The first observation he makes is this human being is no good. He's just a wretched creature. There is no such thing as goodness inside him. All there is is greed and hunger and lust. Everything he does, he does for these animal instincts. That's it. This morality, this goodness, this law, justice, all of this is because he has to function in society, not because he feels like that himself. You give him a little bit of an opportunity, and you'll see what, what I mean. On the inside, he's actually a wild animal. And the only thing keeping him tame is law and order. But there's really no goodness inside him. He's a very corrupt entity on the inside. My uh, abnormal psychology professor used to be uh, very bad now. Very, very bad now. So I won't tell you exactly what he said, but he did say, the human being is so flawed. The human being is so flawed. This was his look at the human being. He's so flawed. He's so disturbed as a person. He's so flawed. Now, there's no good in the human being. The real, what is the real motive then? What is the reason for which we do things? You know the believer says we do things for the sake of Allah, we do things for paradise, etc., etc. Well, listen, a modern person says, a secularist, or an agnostic even says, an intellectual says, a human being really only does things for maybe one of a few reasons. Number one, they're, they're stunning. So that you get a job and, you know, you... Uh, do whatever you do in life and you engage in business or whatever because you gotta feed yourself. That's one. Go a little further, you know, in animals, if you talk about self-preservation. So he does the, he does whatever actions to preserve and protect himself. Then of course Freud came along and said, no, it's it's not just food. Actually, the core motive of the human being is sexuality. That's all he wants. He's got this urge inside him, it's overrunning everything. He actually defines all human thinking from sexuality. That's all he does. That's what Freudian psychology is, essentially. And he's the father of psychology. You understand? Every single school of psychology after him are a ch child of that original thinker, even though they're diverted from him. It's so, you know, this idea that the human being has no good inside him, this, you could say that Freud reached its climax. There's really no good inside him. And he says some really grotesque, disgusting things, which to us are disgusting, but if you, if you leave the idea that the human being has any good inside, they're understanding. He says human beings, you know, uh, uh, the first time, even when the mother looks at her child, there's lust involved, subconsciously. When the child looks at the mother, there's lust involved, subconsciously. The only reason we're not pedophiles and this and that is because society came in and corrected our ways. At least he was smart enough to define three different processes inside the human being, the id, the libido, and the superego, right? There are three divisions in human personality that he found. And he said the highest moral person has, a, has an active superego. But you know for him what the superego is? The superego is the society says something is bad, something is good. This human being listens to that. That's, a, that's the best possible human being. He goes by the standards of society. In other words, it's not a goodness that came from inside of him. The goodness came from where? From society, from the outside. right? Because there's no inherent good inside of him at all. This is the first problem. This is the first observation, there's no good inside of him. Here's the second observation. That whenever the human being acts, the only thing keeping him from harming others is you know, some external force. But if you take all the external forces away and you give him complete control, he will oppress and kill and destroy. He's just going to do nothing but evil. He will do nothing good if you give him complete control. He will do nothing but evil. These, and by the way, these observations as Dirty as they sound, if you're just watching the news every day, if you're just watching the news every day, if you're just studying human history, do you see these observations come true? That human beings are perverted? That human beings will do all kinds of atrocities against each other? This is human history. So now, without any other higher divine teaching, you're just studying the human being, and this is the only observation you reach. That this is all there is to us human beings. Now, before I go further, I want you to understand something about the times in which we live. Before modern times, there were three things that were the most important thing to think about, things to think about in society. The first thing that was really important was God. 
not just in Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, whatever, God was very important in every society. Okay? The second thing that was really important was the afterlife. So in every, even if they're mushriku and they had some concept, I'm going to come back as whatever, a tree, a bird, whatever. But it was very important to them to believe that and to remind themselves of that, to remember God and to remember the afterlife. And there was a third thing that was really, really important. I want you to remember these three things. There was God, there was the afterlife, and the third thing was the human soul. Okay? The, the soul of the human being was very important. Spirituality was very important. This is true in Japanese culture, in Chinese culture, in Indonesian culture, in pagan religions, and in Islam too, right? Because those are deviations of Islam. Over time, Allah gave Islam to everyone, and over time they deviated. But this idea of spirituality and the soul is virtually in every religion. Now we come to modern times. And in modern times, there was a war against religion, right? There was a war against religion. So yes, people believe in God, but God became not as important. Something else became more important, as opposed to God, the universe. Study the universe. Study matter. God is there, is out there, who knows? But the universe is right here. Let's study matter. Let's study physics, chemistry, biology, sciences. Let's study this stuff because it's right here. Right? So there was a shift from the study of the divine to the study of the material universe. That was the first shift. And there was another shift. There was a shift. Instead of worrying about the next life, well, I don't know if it's going to come or not, which life should we worry about then? This, all of our studies, all of our research, all of our endeavors, engrossed in making this life better and better and better. There used to be talk about making your next life better, right? People used to talk about that at lunch. But now what are they talking about well, making which life better? This life. There was a shift. There was a shift in thought. Then the third shift, very, this is the, the third shift is what this surah is about. The emphasis used to be on the soul. It changed to an emphasis on the body. Because the human being is made up of two things, right? The body and the soul. Well, the soul, I don't know what's there, if it's there or not. How can we this scientifically calculate it? It can't, it can't be seen. What I do see is the body. So when we study the human being before this postmodern society, we study the soul. But after, what do we study? The body, psychology, sociology, you know, even in medicine, etc., etc. The human being has been dissected in a hundred different ways, all from the perspective of body. But the human being isn't just a body, is it? There's a body to us and there's also a soul. And what made us the best possible creation? It wasn't just the soil that Allah created, that Allah told him, angels make sajjah to this piece of soil. Or Allah said, When I I blow into it my root, then you fall into sajjah. What gave it the honor? The root. So that which gave the human being honor is no longer steady, no longer a concern. And that which makes him no different than another animal is steady and concern. Our concern goes to it. Now you will understand perfectly natural comes along another intellectual by the name of Darwin and says we are nothing more than evolved animals. This body is just a more sophisticated version of a monkey. That's all it is. There's a donkey and then the more evolved thing is a horse, right? So all we are are more, a better design, monkey 2.0, right? That's all we are. Now if that's all we are, think about an animal. What are the things an animal wants? It wants to feed its stomach, it wants to fulfill its lust, it wants to protect itself, right? It wants to be the, the leader of the tribe, the herd, you know, there's a clash between two lions, right? It has herd mentality, preservation of the self. Darwin says, hey, we want all these things. Freud comes along and says, yeah, exactly. These, these two things kind of merge. And now all the human being is, is just a sophisticated animal with nothing more. Nothing more. And do animals have morality? Do animals have right and wrong? Do animals have a sense of justice? No, these things are not an animal. So they're not really in us too. It's just, we're just a, a higher, you know, more advanced creature. But the thing that gave us honor is removed. The thing that gave us morality is removed. Which is why when you go to a philosophy class in college, a professor will tell you morality is relative. It depends. There's no such thing as absolute morality. This is all man-made stuff. There's no, you know, even religions. Religions are studied as heritages. Oh, you're from Islam? Very interesting culture, you guys. And you're fasting this month, right? That's really cool. 
It must be so good for your diet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're talking to you about your religion as though it's an interesting, you know, you know, heritage. It's an interesting culture. They should make a documentary about it on PBS, just like they make a documentary about wild animals in the safari jungle. They should make a documentary about Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims. So the idea that this religion is the truth is God. It's just a hereditary thing. It's just a cultural thing, and it's been reduced to that. And sometimes Muslims play, play into it and say, "Yeah, we are really interesting, and it's really good for our diet too." The idea that this is the truth. This is not just another culture sitting among many other cultures. This is something far more powerful. That idea gets diluted. But anyway, how, coming back to this, when we, when, the reason I mentioned all of this to you, in the human beings studying, and the way we study human beings today is more sophisticated than we've ever studied it. We know more about the human brain. We know more about human behavior. We know more about the human, you know, all these systems, the digestive, the, the, the cardiovascular, all this stuff. We know more about this today than ever before. And interestingly enough, we are more ignorant about what we really are than ever before. At the same time, we reach that, uh, that oxymoron stage. And you know what's interesting? Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَصُوا اللَّهِ don't become like those who forgot Allah. Remember that the concern used to be God, what did the concern become as opposed to God? The universe? As opposed to the next life, what? This life? As opposed to the soul, what? Body. What are these three, what do these three things have in common? They're all in the unseen. So from the unseen, the focus went from the unseen to the seen. So you forgot Allah. What was the consequence? You forgot Allah, Allah made you, so Allah made them forget their own self. Don't become like those who forgot Allah because Allah made them forget their own selves. They forgot that Allah had honored them. They forgot that they have a ruh inside of them. All they know, they look at themselves, all they see is what? A body. They don't see a soul. They forgot themselves. SubhanAllah. It's such a profound reality in the Quran. Now you will understand this ayah that we're about to uh, uh, study. By the way, one more common uh, uh, modern confusion before we get to the ayah, actually, very important. McDougall, a, a modern psychologist, actually denies that human being has free will. In modern psychology, there's a denial of free will. How? He says, you're made up of your genes. You're a product of genetics. You're a product of heredity. And second, multiplied by your society. There are two influences on you. If you're a student of psychology, even if you took psychology 101, you know this. There's nature and nurture, right? He says, you're already pre-programmed. And on top of that, there's your environment. What you do, you actually have no choice in the matter. This is just a product of what your situation is. This is actually even used in defense and criminal law. Somebody steals and gets caught, well he comes from a tough neighborhood. He didn't have any other situation. The environment was such he didn't have a choice. Right? Or he has certain hormones in his body, certain chemicals are more in his genes than others. That's why it's okay for him to kill. Right? For him to beat up his wife or whatever. Right? So he even denies that we have free will. So first they took away the honor from the human being, then morality from the human being, and now we have free will. We're just acting like machines. What are you? You're just a bunch of chromosomes and genes walking around. That's all you are. You're nothing more. Just another machine. There's nothing more to you than that. SubhanAllah. Now look at the response in the Quran. Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِينَ Word by word by word. La for emphasis. La for emphasis. An emphasis is used when you don't, agree, don't believe something. What Allah is about to say, you don't believe it. You haven't internalized it. So Allah feels the need to say, La, for sure, Qad, already. The word Qad is important. This honoring of the human being isn't something he earned later on. He was given it before he even got here. Allah had already honored the human being before he was even put in the womb of his mother. Allah created the soul of the human being. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We already honored the son of Adam. لَقَدْ then he says, خَلَقْنَا We created. Allah Himself mentions, we created. He didn't just say the human being is the best possible fashion. We created the human being. So don't think genetics and heredity and these are the factors that come and come design the human being. Who's actually the designer? Who's the actual agent at work in designing this, this incredible human being? It is Allah Himself. We created. Al-insan, the human being. Interesting word, al-insan, because it also comes from the word nasiya, to forget. Right? So this forgetful creature. <laughs> but then he says, Fi ahsani taqween. We created the human being how? Fi in ahsan. The word ahsan comes from husn and hasan. Husn means beauty. We'll talk about that a little bit. But it's gone. Next one. 
Hold on. Has it been off all this time? You turned it off there, but. Okay. All right. So, uh, in this ayah of Allah, it's Ahsan. You know, in Quran, there's the word Bahij and Bahir. Also beautiful. But Ahsan is beautiful both on the outside and on the inside, literal and figurative. Abstract, both. So Allah created the human being in the best possible, and then the word taqweem. Taqweem comes from qama originally, to stand. Taqweem is to make something stand upright. Qawwama is used also for a spear. You know, a spear is bent in battle. When you make it perfectly straight, qawwamtuhu. I made it perfectly straight. Okay. Now, taqweem means to take multiple components and to balance them together so they're perfectly straight. It also means to design something perfectly for the purpose for which you were wanted to make it. So you, the car is designed for driving. But if you make the perfect car, this is taqweem of the car. You perfectly designed. Everything is perfectly placed. Okay. Probably not a general mode. But <laughs> just kidding. But anyway, so actually taqweem in the best possible fashion, everything was bad. The word taqdeen is included in taqweem, balance. Now understand, I said already human beings are made up of two parts. The body and the soul. And Allah said I created the human being in the best possible fashion, the best possible balance. There are different entities inside the human being, like there are different body parts inside the human being. Physically also, we're the only ones who walk upright like this. And morally also, we're the only ones who walk upright. Morally also, we walk upright. We look forward. We, 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 we've been given something no other creature has been given. So now, fi ahsani taqweem. This is the response, Allah's response, to the allegation against the denial of the human being's honor. Not only did the human being end up forgetting Allah, they ended up forgetting and disgracing their own selves. And that's a natural consequence when you forget Allah. The human being thinks they're going to forget Allah, they're going to, for their own self. Allah teaches them, فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَاهُمْ They're going to forget their own selves. And this is a state we've reached modern society, there's no religion corrupting the minds of the people. Religion is the opiate of the masses, right? There's no religion corrupting the minds of the people. And yet the suicide rate is the highest ever in history. The, the amount of uh, heinous crimes, highest ever in history. The amount of people, you know, uh, children, of crimes against children, highest ever in history. Strange, demented kinds of crimes, highest ever in history. Why? Because the human being denied himself as the, 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 the grand favor of life given. This, how is it connected to Watin, Wazaytuni, Waturisini, Wahad al Balad al Amin? All of that, I didn't connect them. I explained to you Watin, Wazaytuni, Waturisini, Wahad al Balad al Amin, and separately we started talking about Laqad al Khalaqan al Insana fi Ahsan al Taqweem. But we didn't connect the two. And this is Jawab al Qasim, by the way. This is the response to the oath. And the oath is always a response or connected to the response to the oath. Jawab al Qasim. So, what is the connection? Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us, Isa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the events of their life, and if you take the other interpreter interpretation, even Nuh alayhi salam, do these people look like they are proofs that the human being was created in the best possible fashion? Are they not evidence? What motivations did they have? Was it the stomach they were running after? Was it well? Was it self-aggrandization? Did they want people to appreciate them? Was that what they were running after? Look, study their life. What would you find? Are they not the proof that Allah created the human being above an animal? Something very high. And the highest examples are the Ulul Azam bin al So one, one alim that the, 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 his opinion I sort of inclined towards in this matter, uh, Hamiduddin Farahi rahmahullah, he argued as follows. He said, Atin, the valley between Hamdan and Halwan, referring to Mount Judi, Nuh alayhi salam. Az Zaytun, Al Masjid al Aqsa, Isa alayhi salam. Tulis Yunin, it's obvious. Who is that? The Mount Sinai. Musa alayhi salam. Wahad al Balad al Amin, and this peaceful, entrusted city, who obviously? Rasulullah alayhi salam. How many messengers now? Four. How many Ulul Azim? Five. Well, who's missing? We got Noah, we got Isa, Musa, Muhammad alayhi salam. Who's missing? Ibrahim alayhi salam. But this city, this entrusted city, 
who installed the city, who inaugurated the city, who built the house that was entrusted in the city. All of them are coming. The five greatest examples of human beings, and then Allah says we created the human being in the best possible fashion, already. And the proof is in history. The proof is in the lives of these prophets. The response to the allegation against the human being himself in his own nature, the response to that is in the legacies of these people that the Qur'an is full, full with. You want to know what the upright, the balanced human being is? You know, a psychologist should know what, you know, what the good or the balanced personality is. Study these balanced personalities. These are the balanced persons. SubhanAllah. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Some, a little bit about um, the word خَلَقْنَا as opposed to خَلَقَ and a few things. Allah Azza wa Jal says, خَلَقْنَا We create. He doesn't say He created. He created. He could have said He created, by the way. We will still understand it's Allah. What's the difference between saying He created and we created? He created is ba'id, it's far. We created is close. Allah is illustrating His closeness when He created. Also, we in Qur'an illustrates power and illustrates absolute control. These are the contexts in which we is used. For example, water is something Allah has absolute, absolute control over. He usually refers to water, He says, إِنَّهْنِ Okay, أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا We send down water from the sky. So Allah is taking full control and illustrating His majesty in how He created the human being. The other thing I want to share with you is, there's the, the difference between active and the passive. In the active form, we say, He created. In the passive form, we say, uh, active form, we say, He created the human being. We'll make it a full sentence. He created the human being. In the passive form, we say, The human being was created. Right? In the Quran, we find Allah says, We honored the son of Adam. We created him, or I created him with both my hands. I created him. All active. Okay? We find other places, for example, وَمِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا أُمَّةٌ يَهْدُونَ بِالْحَقِّ And from them, we created. All active so far. We created a nation that would guide with the truth. أَنَّا خَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ We created for them. We, we, we. Now look at this next ayah. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ وَعِقَ The human being was created weak. Allah didn't say, we created the human being weak. He says, the human being was created weak. Who did He not mention? himself. When he said the human being was created in the best possible fashion, he mentioned himself. When he mentioned the human being's weakness, did he mention himself? Allah's name does not deserve to be mentioned next to weakness. And the weakness of the human being is his own fault. Not Allah's. That's he. He's the one who, who becomes weak. So, then he says, The human being was created with an urge to rush was created. He didn't say, I, we created the human being in, in, with an first rush. He was created that way. Inappropriate to mention rushing and weakness next to Allah's name. So the we is removed. SubhanAllah. Then we find in the insana, The human being, no doubt, he was created. This, this anxious. He was, created, he was created like that. Allah doesn't mention his name. But the question arises, the next time, Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ We created the human being. The next ayah says, ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ Then we lowered him. We rejected him and lowered him to the lowest of the low. Isn't this negative? This is negative, right? Lowering him to the lowest of the low. Why did he mention himself next to this word? And I haven't gone through every single bit of the, the ayah yet. But before we do, just this one point. So you understand why the we is used. In رَدَدْنَاهُ I'm going to give you an example. I trained a student. He was a failure. If I say that, I trained a student, he was a failure. Or I raised a boy, he was a criminal. Right? What does that allude to? It alludes to the fact that I wasn't very good at raising a boy. Or I wasn't really good at training a student. Because I trained him and then what happened? He failed. Similarly, I, I uh, manufactured a table. It was broken in a week. What does that illustrate? That I wasn't very good at manufacturing the table. Allah says, I recreated the human being in the best possible fashion. If the next ayah said he was reduced to the lowest of the low, where is the best possible fashion? Do you understand? He says, we reduced him to the lowest of the low. We created him high, but when he wasn't worthy, we ourselves removed him from that position. No other external force removed. 
So Allah is an authority, because if you make the passive here, there's an implication of something being taken incorrectly. That implication has been protected. It's not been mentioned, subhanAllah. By Allah Azza wa Jal mentioning, mentioning the Sayyidat uh, al-Majhul, the, or Ma'roof rather. Now let's talk a little bit word by word about this very, very powerful ayah. فَذَهَبَ قَصَرُ مِنَ الْمُفَسِّرِينَ إِنَّا أَنَّ الْمَقْصُودِ بِهِ أَفْضَلُ الْعُمْرِ There is a group of Mufassirun that said that the meaning of being reduced to the lowest of the low is me, reaching the oldest age, reaching old, old age. In other words, in old age, some even explained this. They said, you know, in old age, an animal is still good for work. An old donkey, you can still put stuff on it. Until he dies, you can work it. But a man, when he gets old, he becomes useless. And he's a burden on people around him. And he can't even take care of himself. Animals can do that till the day they die. Right? So he's, animals are low, he's even lower than that. So that's how they explain it. Others said, This is the weakness of those who used to be strong outside and on the inside, and the loss of intellect and memory and things like that. But if you look at the context, other Mufassirun's commented, if you look at the context of the surah, the context of the surah is not the physical creation of the human being. It's the moral, it's the ethical. Ethic, the soul is what made him so high, right? So it doesn't make sense to mention the low and weakness of the body. What is the weakness now? Spiritual weakness, ethical, moral weakness that's being talked about. And this lowest of the low is very, very powerful language. Let's take it bit by bit. The first word is thumma. Actually, we'll come to thumma at the end. We'll start with radadna first. In Arabic, radadna can be translated to return, to reject, to lord. Somebody gave you something, you didn't accept it. Okay? We rejected him and lord. That's the idea. Okay? Now, in Arabic, to reject can also be aqlama, to change something completely. Could be sarafa, to turn something away. Walda, to turn one's face. Lafata, to tilt slightly towards something. Many different words for turning. This one word, what does it mean? Arrad. It means to reject something based on the fact that it's unacceptable. That's what rad means. Radadna means Allah rejected the human being because he himself became unacceptable. He did something unacceptable. Allah created him in the best possible fashion, and then he did something that made him basically lose that license, and as a result, Allah rejected him. And once he rejected him, where did he end up? Radadna. Asfal Now, asfal means the lowest. In the Arabic language, the word asfal and a'la are antonyms. A'la, the highest part of something, asfal, the lowest part of something. The hadith of the Prophet says, Al yadul ulya khayrun min al yadul yadul sufla. The higher hand, the higher hand is better than the lower hand, meaning the hand that gives is better than the hand that takes. So be the one that gives, don't be the one that takes. That's what the, the, the hadith is saying, using the same word. In Surah Tawbah we find, وَجَعَلَ كَلِمَةَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا السُّفْلَ وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلِيَةِ So Allah may make the word of those who disbelieve the lowest, and the word of Allah is meant to be supreme anyway. It's, it is in fact the highest, right? Now this word is used in Arabic in an interesting way. as sifla is used for low or wretched people, dirty people, nasty people. People you don't want to associate with. You know, I don't mean lower class economically, but I mean lower class socially, like morally. These are not the kind of people, the riffraff, you don't want to be around them. Their language, their demeanor, their morals, you don't want to be around them. This is a sufla in Arabic. Allah says He reduced him to the lowest of the lowest. Safin, by the way, this is aswa, the lowest. Safin means something that is low on the basis of its status, its position is dignity. It's, low, it's meant to be lower and inferior. It's meant to be lower and inferior. Now, we know that Allah created the human being above everything else. So much so that even angels had to do such that. Allah Himself says, After He says, We honored the Son of Adam, He said, We, we gave Him, uh, or we gave Him power over the land and in the sea. He says, Everything on the earth was created for you. Everything on the earth was created for you. Mafil of the Jamina. Everything. Whatever's on the earth, all together, was made for you. So who's higher on the earth? The human being. And everything else is lower than him. The cat, the dog, the car, the building, everything is beneath us. Everything is at our service on this earth. So these things are low and we are what? High. Now Allah says we made him, because of his unacceptable behavior, we made him what? The lowest of the low. 
So the human being became even lower than the things that he was designed, higher than. Now how does this work? We were supposed to worship Allah. When somebody gets rejected, what do they worship? Other than Allah. They worship a tree, they worship the sun, they worship a rock, whatever they worship. Aren't those things lower than them to themselves? They become, they bring themselves lower than something that is meant to be low. They become asfala safilin in their behaviors. Allah. They lower themselves before that which is inherently low. That's how they reduce themselves. Another meaning of asfala safilin that's very powerful is that animals, and we talked about how you know, modern thought has made, reduced human beings to animals. I wish that much was true. It's gotten even worse. It's gotten even worse. Animal, when does an animal strike? When does an animal attack? If it's scared, if it's hungry, right? You know, I was watching a documentary, these sharks, they feed them. They feed them, feed them, they're full. Then you can swim next to them. They won't bite you. Why? Because they're full. But this human being, when he gets really low, then even animals don't strike when their stomach is full. But the human being will continue to rob, and continue to steal, and continue to kill. The animal will stop attacking when the danger is over. But this human being will continue to attack and continue to kill. And the animal, the animals will not ever do things that the human beings, will, you will see them do. You will see them kill children. You will see them engage in genocide. You will see them engage in horrific, horrific acts that you can never imagine even out of an animal. You cannot imagine those things out of an animal. So if the animals are low, what does the human being now become? The lowest of the low. The lowest of the low. Then Allah, some of us said, no, this is actually talking about the hellfire. That if Allah had honored the human being, and he still wasn't able to live up to this, this honor that Allah gave him, that he should be reduced to the lowest pits of the hellfire, like Allah says about the hypocrites, may Allah not make us from them, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ Same word, فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ No doubt the hypocrites will be in the lowest pit of the hellfire. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla, by the way, in Quran, this being even worse than animals occurs in Surah Al-A'raf. Ulaika kal an'am wa lahum adal. They're like cattle. They're even worse than cattle. They're not even even animals are better than them. So thumma radadnahu asfar asad. It's a very powerful, powerful statement. Subhanallah in the Quran. Now let's look what Allah Azza wa Jalla said. Or, or the, the first word that I was uh, holding back from you. Thumma. Thumma yudu ala tarahi. Thumma is used to put gap between things. Thumma is used to put gap between. Allah didn't say Allah honored the human being, all of a sudden He reduced him. Thumma means there was a long time in between those two. Some interpret this to mean when Allah first created the human being in the realm of the souls, like in the 172nd ayah of Surah Al-A'raf, at that time they were honored. And when they came to the earth, they were lower. Others interpret that no, when, the, when human beings were in their, came out of the belly of their mother, they were pure. كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ Every human being is born on predis- pre uh, uh, pre, uh, this destined or pre-programmed decency. That's fitra. That was when they were high, but when they became older, فَأَبَوَهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ Make him Jews, Christian, Magians, whatever. And he lowered himself. Others say, no, when the, before the, when the message first came to him, this is talking about the hypocrites now, when the message first came to him, he was upright. When he started getting tested on it, lowest of the low. But there was a time in between. And the thumma also illustrates Allah gives you time. There's, he won't just punish you just like that, he'll give you an opportunity to stay, to rise back up. And that mercy of Allah is captured in the word thumma. But then the last thing I want to share with you in this context, in, in, in regards to this thumma radadnahu asfana safirin, how do we reconcile this with other ayat in the Quran? On the one hand, we, you know, Allah says we created the human being in the best possible fashion. Then He says the human being was created weak. The human being was created with an urge to rush. The human being is full of despair. Hadu'a. Right? All these problems of human beings. Weakness. He's flawed in so many ways. And on the other hand, he's such a great creation. How can he be both at the same time? How many components of the human being? Two. When they are in balance, he's the best possible creation. When you deny one of them, what happens? The weakness. The weakness arises, the desperation arises, the despair comes out. All the flaws of the human being manifest when this ahsan taqleem in which Allah created you, you stop losing sight of it. You don't address that need of the human being. That's when all these problems occur, subhanAllah. Now we get to the conclusion of the surah. The, uh, the last of the ayat, very, very powerful. By the way, what time is Aisha? 9.15 still? Or? 
In the beginning I said a modern person who's not very religious makes two observations about people. When he looks at the world around him, he makes two observations. One, there is no goodness inside the human being. His only motivations are animal motivations. The second observation was on the outside. His behavior is always corrupt. Given the opportunity, he will do the wrong thing. And they'll cite like, you know, what happened after Katrina, or what happened after an earthquake, people are looting stores and all kinds of stuff. The moment you give them an opportunity, they turn into wild animals, literally, right? Two observations, there's no good inside, and given the opportunity, there's no good outside, you know? What is the remedy to that? There are two problems, right? Inside problem, outside problem? Look at this side. The inside problem is solved, with the exception of those who believe. Where is Iman? Inside. And what's the remedy on the outside? وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَةِ And they acted righteously. Now, when human beings act, when human beings act, they want some reward. They want something. That's why we act. We act because we're running after something. You, you get up early and you go to work because you want to get paid. You go and study for college because you want to graduate. We act because we want something. Our wants are inside, our behavior is outside. Our wants will be cleansed if we have what? Iman. And when Iman is inside, what will be cleansed on the outside? Our behavior. So, the incredible remedy being given to us. And by the way, he's the lowest of the low, right? And he wants to come out of that, so he has to climb up. Remember what surah this has a relationship with? Surah Al-Balad. And in Surah Al-Balad, there was a call to climb up a high mountain. فَلَقْتَحَمَ الْعَقَبَ He didn't, he refused to cry, climb up the high mountain. Right? So you hear you're really low, you better get up there. And what's the way up? الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَةِ This is the way up. Now this is actually the first part. The full explanation of الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ will come in Surah Al-Asr. Where it's fully opened up. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ That's a full explanation. Here it's being alluded to. It's like the seed here, and they'll bloom into a flower there. But it's coming a little bit later on in the 103rd ayah, or Surah of the now anyway, Then they, they, it is only they that have ajr a pay, a recompense, a reward. Ajr is given to you after you put some work in. Now the work was on the inside and on the outside. The work inside was reviving iman, and the work outside was doing good things that reconcile and things that correct. They have, only they have an ajr ghayru mamnoon that is not going to be, now the word mamnoon is common in Arabic nowadays. Mamnoon comes from the word man. Man in Arabic means two things. It means cut, also means favor. Two different things. For example, if you, uh, and this word came up before in Surah Al Shifaq also. In the Arabic language, Al Manino uh, 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 Al the, the, uh, the cloud of dust in the desert, when it's so thick that you can't even see the other side, it cuts your view off. It's called Al Manin, same root because it's cutting off the view. The other meaning is man. The implication of it here is, number one, they will have a reward that will never be cut off. They will have a reward that will never be cut off. The benefit of knowing this is, their deeds are not endless. Their deeds are temporary, but the rewards are endless. Everything else we work for, the deeds are temporary and the rewards are also temporary. So you have to go back and do more and then get more and then do more and then get more and do more and get more. But now you are getting to stop the rat race. You just do this and then you'll have endless. The other word, the word mamnoon is that which will not be imposed as a favor. Meaning Allah will give, Allah will give and ask nothing in return. That will, that they, have, they will have done their part. In the Ladina Amun wa Amun Salihat will have been their part. Uh, another really beautiful comment, comment I found in Tafsir, really, really beautiful. Basically, we have to climb a mountain. The imagery was in Surah al right? We have to climb a mountain. Either you will climb it in this life, or you will climb it in the next life. In this life, in the next life, for example, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, سَقُرْهِبُهُ Saruda. He has to climb up in the hellfire, Hellfire, Walid bin Mughira has to climb up a mountain constantly. Either you're going to climb in this life, out of the woes, or you're going to be stuck climbing forever 
in the next life, may Allah Azza wa Jalla make us of those who rise out of the lows in this life. فَمَا يُكَذِّبُكَ بَعْدِ بِالدِّينِ Now, if you want to really understand the, the placement of this ayah, it's so amazing, so amazing. So far the discussion has been of what the human being is capable of. What the human being really is. He's not an animal, he's more. If you have come to the realization that the human being is more than medicine and diet and exercise and car and outs the needs of the body, that's one thing. But have you not realized that another need too? Don't you realize that there's another need that needs to be fulfilled? So after you come to this conclusion, what is going to take you away? What is going to make you lie against the need? Now what's left? This is interpreted in two ways. We'll look at both. The word ma in Arabic here. Fa, by the way, then, meaning all this argument, haven't you then realized that as a consequence? Now, the word ma could be ma masdariya and ma mausula. There's two grammatical terms in Arabic, okay? And to put them simply, I'll just translate two different ways. The word ma could be referring to what? Okay, that's one interpretation. The word ma could also be referring to what kind of person? Two meanings. What and what kind of person? Ma bi ma'na man. In other words, ma in the meaning of who, who. Let's look at the meaning what. What will make you lie again? What will make you lie against the deen? What will make you make allegations against the religion? After all of this, what is it that is so powerful? that still makes you criticize the religion and make lies against it. And what Allah is saying by the word takdeeb, takdeeb means you actually know it's true, but you're lying against it anyway. That's what the word takdeeb means. You know someone's true, but you're accusing them of being a liar. And in this case, the victim is the deen. So you're lying against the religion, and the only reason you're lying against it is because you know it's true and you don't want to accept it, so the only way you can live with yourself is you criticize the religion itself. People do this all the time, by the way. People don't want to follow the religion. But they don't want to tell you that, yeah, I'm not a good person, I don't follow the religion. So you know what their escape is? Maybe if I criticize the religion and show people how illogical it is, then I won't feel so bad not following it. So the real reason they're poking holes and why this ayah, why this hadith, why this, why that, the real reason is they don't want to follow. Not that they have intellectual curiosity. It's not intellectual curiosity. This is tikdeeb. فَمَا يُكَذِّبُكَ بَعْدُ what is it then that is going to make you lie against the deen? Meaning, are you that much of an animal? Because that's the only thing that could be the batlan, the faraj, the, the, urge, you know, uh, the urge to dominate over others. These are the things that these are so powerful in you that you want to deny your ruh entirely and you lie against the deen. The other meaning of ma is who? And the ka, you can dibuka ka could be Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the meaning would then be different. The way it would be work is fama you can dibuka ba'du bid deen then what kind of first person will lie against you in regards to the deen? What kind of person would it have to be to lie against you, Ya Rasulullah to lie against the deen? It, ha it can only be the lowest of the low. That's the only kind of person who can lie against you, Ya Rasulullah So this is an, a direct slap across the face of Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab. Right, this is a slap across the face. First they were called, Asfal Asafilin. Now, what kind of person could reject you? The only people left are Asfal Asafilin. They're being humiliated by these words. Then there's the word deen, not jaza. How, what, will, what kind of person will lie against you in regards to the afterlife or being paid or ajr? Because ajr and ghayr mamnoon in the previous ayah, right? Why the word deen? Where did the surah begin? A reference to the messengers. What did the messengers bring? Deen. It's, it's complementing what came in the beginning, the word deen. Here's another benefit of the word deen. The word deen in Arabic means judgment, and means precise judgment, and it has two implications, in this world and the next. In this world and the next. If you say payback, jaza, where does jaza take place? The word payback is in the next life. But if you say deen, then it encompasses the teachings and the principles and the motives in this world and in the next word. So the most comprehensive word is used because the messengers brought the deen. Teachings for this life and keys to save yourself in the next life. Both of them are covered. So this, the most comprehensive term is used here. Now, finally, Allah Azza wa concludes, This is a marvel of, of uh, uh, the Qur'an's beauty in speech, this last ayah. 
It's a rhetorical question. When the messenger used to hear it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to say, Subhanak Allah wa bala, ana ala dhalika min al-shahideen. He used to say, how perfect you are, O oh Allah. Of course, you are the, lo- the wisest of the wise, or the ultimate of the rulers. That's a rough translation. And I am of all a witness to that fact. I am a witness to that. So you would respond in the salah even to this ayah. But I want to share with you this, the wording. Alayhi sallam, isn't Allah? Isn't Allah? The way, the, the way this question is asked is actually when, and uh, the way the question is asked is to poke at someone who is ungrateful. Didn't I take care of you? What does that mean? Didn't I take care of you? Means I took care of you. Have you forgotten already? Right? Didn't I do this for you or that for you? The way this is structured is to, to really scold someone who is so ungrateful that they have to be reminded of something so obvious. How dare they forget? Isn't Allah the ultimate ruler of all rulers? Did you forget? Did you forget who created you in the best possible fashion? Have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten that Allah is the one who will either reward you or punish you? Have you forgotten? Now, the, the marvel that I was talking about is in the word ahkam and hakimi. It comes from the word hikmah. You know what hikmah means? Wisdom. Also comes from the word hukum. Hukum means qada, judgment. Judgment, rulership. So the word ahkam could mean the wisest, and ahkam could also mean the most appropriate ruler, the most justified ruler. The word hakimin at the end could mean rulers and could also mean wise people. Which means there are actually four statements in one. That's the marvel of this ayah. There are four statements in one. I'll read the Arabic ones to you first. فَيَكُونُ قَدْ جَمْعُ أَرْبَعَةِ مَعَنْ كُلَّهَا مُرَادَةٍ وَهِيَ أَحْكَمُ الْحَاكِمِينَ بِمَعْنَى أَكْثَرُهُمْ حِكْمًا it could be the wisest of the wise, those who is most in, uh, among them in wisdom. Aqbal hukama, the most rightful judge among all those who claim to have wisdom. So the first was the wisest of the wise. The, be- the second one is the best judge among the wise. Okay, here's the third one. Wa aqbal and the most appropriate judge of all judges, the most appropriate ruler of all rulers. And then finally, wa ahkam al and the wisest of all rulers. Four implications: the wisest of all rulers, and I'll put them in English to you now simply: the wisest of the wise, the most appropriate judge among the wise, the, the most appropriate judge among all judges, and then the most wise of all judges. Four implications of one statement: And this teaches us something very powerful about the beginning of the surah. You know, the beginning of the surah made reference to the messengers and their, their legacies. Their legacies. But that, that legacy was, they, Allah gave them two things. Allah gave them wisdom, that was revealed, and Allah gave them instructions. Judgment, Allah's judgments was re- were revealed. Two things. And Ahkam al Hakimin contained two things. What are they? Allah's wisdom and Allah's judgment. Just like the deen, essentially the deen is two things. It's Allah's wisdom and Allah's Judgment, that's what those two things are. So the beginning and the ending are complementing each other. Here, another thing that should not pass our notice is in the middle of the surah we read, Khalaqna, we created the human being. But here we say, Alaysa Allah, not Alasna. Allah doesn't say, Aren't we the best possible ruler? He says, Isn't Allah. So it went from first person, we created, to third person, isn't Allah. That's third person. And the third person is used in the case of judgment. Because a judge has to be impartial and distanced from those who he judges. This is part of the wisdom of the eye. The ju- you know, when a judge, he cannot show closeness to the one he passes judgment on. He has to distance himself because justice comes first. Okay? So this is uh, uh, one of the final benefits of the, uh, the, the wording of the ayah. I want to give you an overview of the logic of the surah and then we're done, inshallah. Ta'ala. Allah begins by the mention and the legacies of four most noble messages. Then he says, he created the human being in the best possible, most intricate design, balanced fashion. What is the proof of that? The four messengers. Now, if those were the four, you know, uh, those messengers, or five even, if they were the best of the best, then whoever would reject them would have to be what? The worst of the worst. The next ayah is, But not everybody rejected them. Some people believe. 
So first the best of the best, then the worst of the worst. Then who is going to be exception from the worst of the worst? And then finally, now that you understand this, what is left for you to reject? I, I, uh, the, the last comment, inshallah ta'ala, about this, uh, this wonderful, wonderful surah of the Quran, surah 15, is in regards to just our connection with it. This surah is basically telling us that we have a higher purpose in life. We're more than animals. Even as Muslims, sometimes we wear the garb of Islam, but on the inside, there's still an animal. Right? On the inside, there's just batan fakr. There's just you want to fill your belly, and you want to fulfill your desires, and that's it. There's nothing else. What was cleansed first? إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّلِحَةِ Iman is where? Inside. And then righteous deeds are on the outside. And I was trying to talk about this in the Jum'ah khutbah, I don't know, the Eid khutbah, I don't know if I, it came across clearly enough or not. But essentially, there are two kinds of problems within Muslims. You have a Muslim who's good on the inside, but pretty bad on the outside. Then you have a Muslim who's really good on the outside, but it's filth on the inside. And nobody knows that except himself. Nobody knows that except himself. You could look the most religious, you could dress the most religious, you could talk the most religious, you could have the most religious knowledge, but that doesn't mean you're clean on the inside. That's all on the outside. That's all on the outside. Don't be reduced, don't think that you're high up there, but you've already been reduced to it. The lowest of lows. It's a very serious warning for the people of knowledge. That whoever seeks knowledge, you know, may Allah protect you know, our, our scholars, Imam, Dahi, especially, when the people who worship and people appreciate them, and this guy's at the masjid all the time, or does this or that or the other, or oh, this sister is so good. What happens is sometimes the outside is very good, and the inside is just disgusting and dirty. It's, it's, it's incredibly hollow. That balance is lost. And the surah is entirely about balance. That's what the surah is about. May Allah Azza wa make us a people of balance. May Allah Azza wa Give us a, a, a love and respect for his messengers والسلام, and his deen. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make us appreciate the beauty and majesty of his book. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa nuhu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.